Hi students. Welcome to another session of film studies. You have completed two modules now. The first module and the second module looked closer at some of the basics of film production, some of the basics of um, a scene, uh, some of the basics of um, how a film is produced, how a film is created, the, the fundamental components in a film and so on. Trying to understand um, what it is to do a film criticism or a film appreciation. So you have done all of that in the past two uh, modules. Now we are going on to the third module. So third module and fourth module will focus more on critical theories. We will try to understand cinema from different perspectives. We will try to understand the, the relation between cinema and society. We will try to understand how cinema is to be understood, how a film is to be understood, how a film is to be analyzed. And as a, as a student, uh, as an academic, as a, as a researcher of films, how would you want to look at a film? The different possibilities. That is what we are going to tr uh, try and understand, some of the basics of it in these two modules. So again, uh, let's begin the first unit of the third module. So this module, this session, will basically talk about cinema and ideology. Now, we will try to understand what cinema is from the perspective of ideology. And we will also look at cinema uh, as, uh, or the concept of national cinema. Cinema as a product of the national identity or cinema as a product of the nation. And how does cinema play a significant role in nation building? Okay. So beginning with the idea of cinema and ideology. So what do you understand of ideology? Yeah? And how does, how does ideology connect with cinema? So ideology, as you probably have already studied, is, is a kind of belief systems or um, you know, some kind of ideas that reflect the needs of a group or a community or sometimes even a nation. And the most important aspect is that, aspect of ideology is that, it has a very basic uh, relationship with power. So ideologies are usually some kind of structures within societies which has some kind of power hierarchy inherent in them. A very easy example would be patriarchy, right? When you talk about patriarchy, we understand that there is a hierarchy, there is a power relationship that is inherently present in, uh, in patriarchy. So such discourses are what we understand as ideologies. Now, when you look at cinema, how does cinema carry these ideologies? It is usually within the shots, it could be in characters, it could even be in the way in which it is edited. So look out for these elements in a cinema, in a film, when you watch a movie. When you want to understand the ideological dimension in a film, try to look for the missing scene sometimes or uh, how editing has happened in that film. What are the things that are highlighted? What are the things that are hidden? What are the subliminal messages that a film is trying to convey? So these are all different dimensions which will help you to understand how ideology is packed in a movie, right? So. Let's move a, a step forward and understand why cinema is considered to be ideological. So film, as we know, is a product of a technology or it has certain technologies involved in it. You cannot make a film without the help of technology. Now, the moment you have a technology which is sort of driven by capitalism, which is sort of part of the, the advent of modernity, uh, we understand that uh, it has a certain economic system that is helping uh, the, the film industry to flourish. So as we look at this economic system that is dominant in a particular point in time, uh, it will always have the, the support. It would probably be called the dominant ideology of that particular time. So I'm trying to connect cinema with dominant ideology. So in any society, in an economic system, there is, there is an economic system which is the dominant one. 
and this dominant economic system is what is helping film industry thrive so therefore there will always be the impact of this ideological um, system that is in power economically um, trying to influence the way cinema is being created so how how do certain films go through and become you know a reality and not just remain as an idea in the head of the filmmaker it is with the support of that uh, system the system which is ideologically powerful at any point in time so therefore film becomes a commodity because it requires a lot of money and therefore it has a it is a commodity it has an exchange value and once it has an exchange value because as you know we need to buy tickets we need to sign contracts so there is a very clear economic perspective behind it or an economic dimension behind it so uh, which is also governed by laws of the market so being a material product uh, and a part of the system film therefore becomes part an integral part of the ideological system as well so if somebody tells you that this is what the public wants you know this is a film which is just created because it is what the public wants it 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 is plainly a very simple statement which try which is trying to tell you that this is what the dominant ideology at any point in time requires so when you see a film like the kerala story for that matter and uh, you think that this is what the public wants you should remember that this is what the dominant ideology at this point in time requires from us from the uh, from the society from the nation right so so as i was mentioning again since it is so film has the support of a dominant ideology and film is therefore ideologically driven and therefore the camera cannot be impartial camera cannot capture the reality camera is therefore ideologically uh, uh, present at any point in time so ideological dimension of a cinema cannot be denied it is a fact yes so there are different ways in which uh, ideology is sort of uh, established or uh, kind of given forth through a film uh, these are different ways of doing it so in some films this is extremely present you know you don't really have to go hunting for it it is very much there you know cinema just becomes unconscious instruments of ideology so what the dominant what the public wants is in fact what the dom dominant ideology wants as as i mentioned earlier and this kind of these kind of films uh, which i just mentioned are such unconscious vehicles of ideology so the second kind of films would be films that sort of uh, attack ideological assimilation they they do it in different ways in fact sometimes uh, it is by very direct political action uh, you know where um, there are um, some kind of tropes that are used to challenge the dominant ideology sometimes it is um, you know um, more subtle ways of questioning um, authority uh, so these films you you will see um, uh being sometimes it gets really uh, you know critiqued sometimes it gets a lot of um, you know attraction a lot of um, attention uh and uh, they attack um, sometimes it is through characters a film that comes to my mind right now is a film like puru uh, in malayalam uh, it's a film that very successfully um, questioned some of the very basic injustices in society some of the very basic ideological um, you know dimension that uh, in yeah as a country has especially uh, with regard to caste system uh, or films on gender basically from uh, from popular hindi cinema um, uh, films uh, where you have um, films like or a film like badai do uh, which talks about uh, an older woman getting pregnant and all of that so there are these films which uh, very subtly question some some of the dominant ideological positions um, sometimes uh, films are not um, explicitly political uh, but they use certain formalistic devices to challenge these um, dominant ideologies uh, and then of course there are uh, films which are explicitly political and um, i can't but not mention uh, mrinal sen's films which i find to be extremely political uh, and they are 
deeply embedded in the political ideological system and challenges it uh, continuously. Uh, sometimes um, this internal criticism uh, may not be enough and then there will be much more uh, sharper criticism of the dominant ideology. So cinema has always been trying to, filmmakers have always been trying to question, trying to challenge these dominant ideologies in different ways. And one needs to understand the kind of impact that it has on society. We already know that cinema has become one of the most powerful uh, cultural practice, some of the, one of the most powerful cultural products um, in contemporary society. Uh, so therefore, its ideological dimension becomes extremely important. And it is important, it is imperative that uh, any scholar who is interested in cinema should definitely take a look at the ideological dimension as well. Now, Moving on from ideology, or um, I would like to move uh, into another aspect of um, cinema, as I mentioned earlier, the second uh, section, which would look at national cinema. Now, we already have established, uh, in fact, I have established that cinema is ideological. Now, if cinema is ideological, what is its role in nation building? So cinema has always been part of the nation building process. As we know, as you probably have already studied, that na nation, the, the whole concept of nation is a construct. Right? It is, it is an imagined community, as Benedict Anderson would say. So it is an imagined community. And since it is an imagined community, since it is a construct, one has to constantly try and create a sense of oneness, sense of unity, sense of um, uh, a national identity for its people to come together and stay together. And cinema, in this context, becomes extremely powerful a medium. Now, how does cinema do that? Now, let's take a look at the first movie, The Birth of a Nation. How does cinema, now that is, what, that is a movie that is often quoted as uh, an example of how this kind of oneness is created, some kind of homogeneity is created. Sadly, the film uh, uses the idea of the other. So by creating the, the black community as the other, the birth of a nation creates a national identity, which is the, the white, uh, mostly the white male. So the black community is othered to create a sense of oneness. Now we see this constantly happening in uh, every nation, in fact. If you look at any, any cinema, even Indian cinema, which I will come to later on. So uh, national cinema is an idea or cinema as a product of the nation is an idea that is very interesting. It helps us to understand how a nation is imagined as well. This relationship between the nas nation or the, uh, the, the national um, subject and uh, film as, a, as an art form. Now, there are several, um, several interesting articles on this, but I have used Stephen Crofts for, my, uh, for this um, lecture. Now, Stephen Crofts talks about uh, different kinds of cinema. He sort of categorizes them as first cinema, second cinema, and third cinema. So he says the first cinema is usually of uh, any film that comes from Hollywood or films that sort of uh, emulate the, the kind of filmmaking that we see in Hollywood. So what is this kind of this Hollywood cinema? There is a particular pattern in Hollywood films. So here you see that um, uh, they, they usually follow a particular trope. It has a particular uh, narrative and uh, it is usually about uh, the bourgeois uh, interest, the commercial interest. You, you sort of have um, a person, uh, uh, the consumer as uh, uh, a consumer of ideology uh, and reality as is conceived by the ruling, um, the hegemonic class. So, uh, so this is something that you see and it is usually in English language since it's a Hollywood movie. So first cinema usually addresses the concerns of the bourgeois um, category of people and it sort of uh, talks about uh, the concerns and uh, the interest of the ruling class. Now, first cinema is, as I said, in English language. Therefore, uh, there will be a lot of countries around the world with that do not understand this language. So if you look at early cinema history, you would see that these films went everywhere. Uh, 
So Hollywood cinema went across the world, sometimes in their own language, sometimes uh, <clears throat> they went as a foreign language. But still, it was consumed around the world, globally. And it sort of established its, um, you know, exclusive supremacy across the world. So this was first cinema. And it had a very, as I mentioned earlier, very clear patterns. It talked about only this hegemonic ideologies. And sort of in contrast to this, we have the second cinema. Now, what is the second cinema? It is mostly the European auteur cinema. So we have a lot of uh, interesting filmmakers, auteurs who came from Europe, who made films in their native mother tongues. So those films were more of artistic films. Uh, they had more of an artistic quality. They were more varied. The interest uh, that these filmmakers had in different um, genres and different uh, characters and you know the way they experimented with style and form so all of this made second cinema very interesting and very diverse so second cinema also had a lot of audience especially in very elite circles the cinema actually looked at or it sort of stretched its horizons in terms of form and style coming to third cinema now uh, uh, of course, there are uh, certain criticisms leveled against the second cinema as well uh, before I come to third cinema because th second cinema was also, uh, you know, critiqued for its uh, distance from the common man. It sort of took reality, you know, sort of gave reality uh, a, a, a sort of a, a marginal position and sort of explored with the content, explored with their imaginative, uh, you know, um, creative spirit. So therefore, there was a lot of people who were not so happy with the second cinema because it was um, it was sort of uh, sometimes even nihilistic. Um, sometimes the experiments went a little too far and sort of uh, kept themselves away from the, the general public. Of course, these films were kind of counter public in nature because they they questioned authority, they questioned ideology. So that was there was a very different space. And of course, we found we got a lot of interesting filmmakers as well. Now comes the third cinema. So this was more like a post colonial cinema. Third cinema was more a connect connected to reality and history. It was linked with uh, the national culture. And this is where I would want to talk a little bit more about national cinema, especially in the context of countries like India. So third cinema, a very interesting uh, character here would be a Brazilian um, uh, filmmaker uh, called Rocha. So Rocha, in his work, Aesthetics of Hunger, uh, talked about the third cinema in very interesting ways. So Rocha, in An Aesthetic of Hunger, which was written in 1965, called for an organic relationship uh, between film style and the objective conditions surrounding uh, film production. So uh, I'm just quoting him which I uh, because I think this is very interesting. He said, our originality is our hunger. So this was a there was a lot of uh, you know symbolic representation of the real existence, real lives of people in the third world countries. So there was um, so he said uh, he he uses this word an idea in the head and a camera in the hand, which I thought again is a very interesting way of talking about third cinema. So a lot of films that came from India, uh, art art films that came from India during these times of you know seventies eighties, they all fall under the third cinema. So these these films explored a lot of possibilities. They they tried to depict the real conditions of human existence uh, in these third world countries, especially talking very loudly about uh, hunger and you know uh, deprivation and slums and all of that. So third cinema is a very powerful expression uh, uh, from the third world countries. Now in India. National cinema is again very interestingly um, situated because, of course, our um, country also has uh, their own trajectories, um, its own trajectory as far as national identity is concerned. And um, in, in India, national cinema developed in a very interesting way or the way in which national interests were portrayed in these films. So if you look at early um, 
Indian cinema, especially Hindi cinema, you would see how the concerns were all about the welfare state. You know, uh, the uh, post-independence, the early Indian cinema post-independence tried to look at, uh, try to consolidate itself as a nation by talking about uh, the concept of the welfare state. So you have films where uh, the, uh, the hero goes, the protagonist goes to villages and constructs dams and, you know, the whole idea of progress and modernity and development uh, was very clearly uh, defined in these films. And as we move ahead, uh, so so you have people like Dilip Kumar and others acting in these, Manoj Kumar, Dilip Kumar, you know, these people acted in these films where you have the protagonist go into the village um, and um, establish new modern uh, machinery and all of that. Or you have uh, characters, uh, you know, like soldiers and farmers trying to build the nation. So this was a very, uh, very interesting, um, you know, um, concern that uh, filmmakers had and it was very closely connected to the nation or the building of the nation. So this was a very young India that we are talking about. And as we move forward, you also see how this keeps changing. So by the end of 1980s, early, uh, maybe around 80s, uh, we have Amida Bachchan, the interesting, um, you know, actor who came up with the whole uh, notion of the angry young man. So how, where do you place this angry young man? It is definitely within the context of the nation. It is the nation that sort of failed to provide education, sort of uh, not really education, but more of employment. So this is about the concerns of young people who were unemployed, who were educated but unemployed, who were concerned about the corruption that they saw around them. So you suddenly see the shift in the discourses. So there is a questioning of the ideology. There is a questioning of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of injustices that you see. So there is a kind of disillusionment as well with the whole nation. And uh, you see how it is reflected in these films. So national cinema in India was sort of evolving from there. And by the 1990s, what you see is this new hero, right? There is a new hero in the horizon. It is a hero who is clearly constructed around the values of neoliberalism. So we have a neoliberal hero who is more concerned about being enterprising, about, uh, you know, being a little more, um, uh, you know, sort of interested in the future and uh, more concerned about their self-growth. And um, uh, it's a very different kind of a hero who, who, is, who believes that... Um, one can grow by themselves. You don't need the support of the system. You don't need anybody else. You don't need to look at the administration for support or help. Let us make it on our own. So this was the neoliberal hero, Shah Rukh Khan and others sort of established this. And in between, there were films which sort of tried to question, tried to understand the concept of the nationhood. So films like Rang De Basandi or, you know, those films actually helped you or asked certain questions, certain very uh, pertinent questions. So nation was being constructed, you know, in between you would see there are certain films that you would talk very explicitly in the context of national identity, films like Mother India or as I mentioned already, already Rang De Basandi. Or, um, you know, there are so many of them in those, uh, in those categories. But every single film, as I mentioned earlier, right in the beginning of the session, that every film is ideologically constructed. So to conclude, national cinema is something that we need to understand or we need to look at from the perspective of ideologies. What are the kind of ideologies that a nation sort of put forth at any point in time? And you can definitely see them through the through a, a close understanding, a close reading of the films that are being produced at any point in time. So um, before I conclude, I would like to tell you that uh, you can keep reading on uh, national cinema. So I will be sharing um, texts to be read and films to be watched in the context. Please do watch those films and read those texts. That will really help you to understand the concept of uh, ideology in cinema as well as national cinema. Thank you.